Hi everyone, uh, welcome to uh, the webinar which is hosted by Shiksha.com and presented to you by MUSP. Uh, today we have uh, with us our experts, our esteemed panelists, uh, which include Dr. Narendra Jadhav and Mr. Pratham Mittal, who are representing Masters Hi. Union School of Business uh, here for us. So uh, Dr. Narendra Jadhav is a global economist, a distinguished policymaker and educationist, and a best-selling author. Is currently a nominated member of parliament from Rajya Sabha and formerly served as the chief economist of RBI, among several other leadership roles he held over the years. He'll be teaching economics and public policy at the Masters Union School of Business. I'll tell you something about Masters Union School of Business. It is a new age business school where noted practitioners, such as Dr. Jadhav themselves, would take classes and teach in an internship style format, driven by life projects, boot camps on emerging technologies, and even a life investment fund that students themselves manage. Other teachers at the master's union include Karthik Ramanna, HBS and Oxford professor, Saika Chaudhary, who is a Wharton professor, and former CEOs and MDs of l and Morgan Stanley, BCG, Adani, and Tata. So we would want Dr. Narendra Jadhav to start uh, with the topic and uh, Dr. Jadhav, over to you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Kshitij, uh, for a very generous introduction. Uh, good morning, friends. It is uh, a real pleasure. I'm truly delighted uh, to connect with you. The theme for our discussion today is post-corona crisis. Our world would never be the same again, ever. The corona crisis, as we all know, or COVID-19, as it is often called, has triggered an unprecedented crisis uh, of cataclysmic proportions all over the world. As of uh, this morning at 8 o'clock, the total number of confirmed cases were uh, 1.7 million. Death toll has now crossed 100,000, and it is uh, now around 103,000 all over the world together. And in many cities of the world, there is either partial or a complete lockdown. Sheer size of this crisis is shocking. Who could have believed only four months back that there could be a virus, one virus, which will disrupt the entire world economy? But that is exactly what is happening uh, through corona crisis, and it continues to do so. What are the origins of this crisis? I want to go a little fast on some of these issues. Uh, while eating bats uh, in the Wuhan province of China may be the initial trigger point, but there is a root cause of the problem is different. The root cause of the problem is the destruction of ecological balance in the name of economic growth and development that has been going on. That is the root cause of this grave crisis. Well, one of the questions that is often asked is, how is it that nobody could see it coming? How come nobody cares that this is happening? Uh, in fact, one international channel uh, had a story that and they called it the biggest intellect, intelligence failure uh, of, of humanity. This is simply not true. Out of fact, Bill Gates, in one of his TED Talks in the year 2015, and I would like to quote him. He said, if anything kills more than 10 million people in the next two decades, it would be a highly infectious virus rather than a war. It would not be missiles. It would be microbe. And what he called a greatest risk to global of global catastrophe. And he also gave the reason why that is going to happen. He said that while we have made huge investments in developing nuclear deterrent, we have not spent enough to develop systems that can face academics or pandemics. And this was the question that he asked in 2015. Uh, why, why he was absolutely true, his predictions were absolutely true. Uh, I wonder with all the resources at his command, why did the Bill Gates himself not uh, start that process? Uh, I wish he had. How is this crisis different? 
from all the grave crises that humanity has seen before. Uh, this crisis is different from all the human crises, uh, crises earlier in at least four respects. First is the speed of spreading. Uh, SARS took the, the Spanish flu, the great one in 1918, it took 263 days to spread all over the world. SARS took 130 days to affect first 1,000 uh, uh, people. COVID-19, on the other hand, took only 48 days to affect first 1,000 people. What it means is that the spread of this is phenomenal and it is going on in a geometric proportion. That is the first thing which is different about this crisis. Second thing is that this is bigger than any other economic crisis that we have faced since the Great Depression of 1929. So people compare with crisis of 2008 when there was a global meltdown. Global meltdown was one shock in one country that had a spillover in another country. This is 100 shocks of 10 times larger, 100 shocks at the same time all over the world. So they are not comparable at all. The third thing which is different about this crisis is that it is far more uncertain than the crisis that we have seen earlier. This is one crisis where we do not even know what we do not know. And uh, we, we don't know how fast Corona will spread. We also don't know whether the monster is going to come back again, as some people are talking about in uh, October or November of this year. Most importantly, we do not know when the vaccine would be developed. We also do not know when a definitive curative treatment would be available to masses. This is the third thing that, that is different. Fourth thing, which is very different about this crisis, is that typically when a crisis takes place, particularly the economic crisis, it is either on the demand side or on the supply side. This is one crisis which is hitting at the world economy from both demand side as well as supply side. And uh, it is affecting manufacturing as well as services sector. That said, let's quickly have a rundown of uh, what is the present status. This morning, the confirmed cases in the world were about, uh, uh, about uh, 1.62 million. And uh, out of this 1.62 million, uh, the number of deaths so far, as I mentioned earlier, is about 103,000 uh, or thereabout. The top 10, uh, I don't want to go over the list, but in terms of the confirmed cases, US today morning crossed the 5 lakh barrier. It is 5 lakh and 3,000. Then comes Spain, then Italy, France, Germany, and China in that order. As far as the deaths are concerned, number one happens to be Italy with about 1,849 deaths. Second position now is United States. It has rapidly come up to the uh, top level. It is at the second position, uh, close second, 18,747 deaths so far. Uh, as far as India is concerned, this morning's number are about 7,600 confirmed cases and the number of deaths are about 249. That is the picture at 8 o'clock this morning. Now, the biggest one, biggest three states are Maharashtra number one, Tamil Nadu number two, and Delhi number three. Uh, one of the reasons why such a large scale, the numbers are not large, we are not in the top 10, we are not even in top 20. The reason being, that enough number of tests have not been done. We are increasing the number of tests, and uh, so the number of cases might grow, might increase in future, because simply because we have more tests. And uh, it is also partly the impact of the lockdown that has been very effectively been done. What is the impact of this crisis on the global economy? Let's compare this crisis with other crises. When Spanish flu took place in 1918, the global GDP had come down by about 6%. The GDP, one estimate is that GDP of the world will come down by 2.2%. This looks small, but it is incredible in terms of the size and the When group of 20 systemically important countries, they control more than 75% of the world production. Then the 2020 was supposed to be about 
2.3%. Now it has been revised to minus 2.2%. What does that mean? That means there is a swing, downward swing. Extraordinarily large, and we still don't know. So it is very clear that we are heading towards, if not Great Depression, extremely big recession. So we are heading towards Great Recession. Uh, country wide, if you see, the Western Europe is supposed to be hit by about 6% of GDP will come down. US minus 2.8% would be the GDP growth rate. Uh, so major countries are going to be hurt in a major way in terms of the growth, in terms of rising, uh, slowing down of growth dramatically, and getting into the recession with the concomitant very large unemployment. Uh, China, according to one estimate given by the European, uh, uh, European Intelligence Unit, uh, it says that India and China will do better as compared to the Western countries. They say that China will report a growth rate of 1% uh, for this year, and India will report 2.1%. But please note that these numbers, you know, Chinese numbers are very small as compared to what they did uh, for a very long time, more than 10% growth. Indian growth rate has also will dramatically come down. Uh, but again, I, I must emphasize that these are not estimates. These are estimates as we go on. Uh, what is the dilemma for the policymakers all over the world, not only in India? You know, uh, in economics, they talk about dilemma. That there are three things. You can choose only two. You can't achieve all three. The classic uh, Mundel Fleming uh, trilemma was you can't have all three. First is fixed exchange rate. Second one is free capital movement. The third is uh, independent monetary policy. They said that you can't achieve all three at one. Uh, you can achieve any two. And for this, they were given Nobel Prize. Now people are talking about the trilemma that is imposed by COVID-19. What is the trilemma? The trilemma now is you cannot have all three. What are those three things? Healthy economy, more medically healthy society, and healthy democracy. You can have any two, but you can't have three. For example, if you keep the economy running, the restaurants are open, flights are going on, everything is business as usual. What will happen is more and more people will get sick and more and more people will die. At the other extreme, if you keep the economy under a lockdown, as it is today, if you continue to keep it locked down, there would be a major, major recession, massive unemployment, poverty, malnutrition, and even starvation deaths. So that is a dilemma there. If you look at the dilemma between healthy economy and healthy democracy, you will find that if you want to keep the economy healthy, uh, like China did, uh, China did, where every action is monitored and graded, and it becomes a surveillance state, uh, that kind of thing at the cost of uh, the people, then you will not have healthy democracy. So if you want to have a healthy society, uh, healthy uh, economy, you will not have healthy democracy. So if the policymakers want democracy, another way to interpret this dilemma is that if policymakers want democracy, then they must choose between a healthy economy and healthy population. It must be recognized, however, that these kind of uh, dilemmas, they are not absolute, they are negotiable. Uh, response to the crisis can be short-sighted, panicky, and destructive, or it can be radical, innovative, and constructive. Uh, please note that, like China succeeded in containing it, South Korea also did, and South Korea is a democracy. So uh, the response to the crisis would have to be absolutely must include widespread testing, contract tracing, which may, even though it entails certain uh, loss of privacy. Uh, clearly, while dealing with COVID-19, we must protect public health and also preserve at the same time social and political fiber of our country, of our lives. And this applies everywhere. What are the, very quickly, what are the non-economic impacts of uh, COVID-19, please note that this crisis is not a temporary rupture. This is not a blip. 
this is a change of trend it is a turning point and there is a major paradigm shift in our lives our world would never be the same again let's take a look at what happens to non economic factors what would be the geopolitical impact first thing the us has been weakening in terms of its global impact and that process is going to be speeded up it would be expedited because of this crisis european union has you know its limitations in acting as a protective force for the entire group has already been proven to be a myth and that would mean these two things would mean that china the china will china will gain even more prominence than before and this will in fact hasten the process of china achieving the number one slot in the global economy russia will also gain prominence what does that mean if china and russia gain a lot of prominence arguably it would not augur very well for the democracies of the world what would be the social impact social distancing in future will be a rule it will be a norm not an exception as it is now and uh, no more hugs no more shake hands no more parties no more big gatherings all that is gone i think and wherever possible activities will go virtual by the way what, do you know what is the word for social distancing a good word in hindi for social distancing is tanduri tan duri so that will become a norm rather than an exception so question that people will ask is that will will not be is it a reason to be to do this on online no, that is not the kind of question will be asked in future the question asked would be is there a good reason to do this in person so going viral uh, going virtual is going to be the reality there would be a paradox of uh, online communication while the connectivity between people would be more the distance between them would also be larger in fact everybody will feel safer because of this separating distance between them and this is going to be the norm what about technological impact there would be a huge increase in telemedicine healthcare delivery services would completely change regulatory uh, barriers on online tools will fall more and more people will have will be allowed to will have to be allowed to work from home cyber space issues will gain a lot of prominence in fact the un secretary general has only this other day said that this crisis shows how bioterrorism will unfold in future if it happens what would be the effect on the government forget about the uh, no forget about no more you know no more minimum government maximum governance that is gone it will be maximum government and maximum governance now new india countries like india new psus will come on based on pharmaceuticals and in usa government itself will become a big pharma player as i can see what will happen to the democracy electronic voting will go mainstream voting by mail will become a norm rather than an exception and there will be no excuse on election day there would be election month because voting counting votes uh, which are sent by mail will take a long time eventually one can even visualize that parliaments will go virtual in india parliament 775 people come together uh, in one place and that kind of thing is going to be avoided as far as possible so what will happen in course of time is that the ways will be found Uh, to make uh, even parliaments go virtual so th the whole life the entire range of our life is going to be completely different from what it was for so long uh, that is why i say that our world will never be the same ever again now this part is over i will take your questions now but after the break after the question q and a Uh, and other uh, small presentations a uh, second part of uh, uh, my presentation will be focused exclusively on indian economy and what is going to be the effect of indian economy right. so uh, thank you so much rajendra uh, right 
so we have uh, certain questions which are related to uh, you know uh, the economy uh, and uh, indian economy and the world economy so we'll take them one by one so we have deep kanani who wants to ask we can clearly see this is going to harm our economy too fast so are we going to face the recession uh, like uh, we faced back in 2008 okay all right no this as i mentioned this shock is going to be a lot bigger than uh, the shock of 2008 uh, there they were talking about mandi now the mandi will actually come that time we were talking about the slowdown but a lot of people interpreted that as mandi we are now talking about the possibility of a real mandi technically speaking mandi happens to be a situation when in two consecutive quarters the real gdp growth becomes negative and that possibility cannot be ruled out now depending on the length of the lockdown if we keep the lockdown for 3 months surely our economy would go in the negative territory so the situation would be lot worse than what it was in 2008 another question thank you so much sir and uh, the next question is from swapna shri saha what is the uh, what are the considerations for essential versus non essential during covid 19 you know what is uh, going to happen is that uh, there is a clear distinction between essential and non essential in the sense that saving lives as the honorable prime minister has said is the topmost priority now saving life would mean doing everything that we can uh, from the mask to ventilators to uh, you know creating the entire infrastructure let me confess that uh, uh, one of the thing that we have never done is that we have never spent enough on public health you know uh, we have been spending like in respect of government all governments have done that so we are not talking about a particular government our expenditure on public health has never been more than 1% of gdp that is peanuts as compared to most other countries so we have a very weak uh, health infrastructure so priority would have to be given to building that uh, infrastructure to cope with the big challenge that the country is facing so in that context what essential is clearly it stands out everything else has a low priority the top most priority comes here yeah third question uh, so uh, we have uh, sobhishri saha again uh, so what do you think about proposals to expand imf leading by issuing more sdr Sorry, say that again, please. So she says, what do you think about proposals to expand IMF, leading by issuing more SDR? Ah, uh, expand more, expand IMF, International Monetary Fund. Yes. Well, you must be the only person who is talking about expanding the International Monetary Fund. Nobody, nobody is talking about it. They are talking about closing it down. No, now I think the most important group for the cooperation. See, they, the multilateral institutions will remain. Three multilateral institutions: International Monetary Fund, World Bank, and the WTO. These are the basic international mechanisms which will continue to work jokes apart however the most powerful policy group today is g20 that is a group of 20 which has 20 systemically important uh, countries uh, in the world they they come together and they they had a first time they had a virtual meeting Uh, of all G20 leaders, and they they have taken some important decisions. So, increasing the world cooperation, economic cooperation, economic and other medical uh, cooperation is the order of the day, and that is being done uh, with with uh, the systemically most important countries. Uh, well, friends, uh, I have to take a break here. Uh, it is abundantly clear, friends, uh, from the discussion we have had so far, and we are we are going to continue this discussion. it should be abundantly clear that we need more effective managers now to handle the situation and i believe that masters union could be extremely useful in this process of creating such professionals um, i am delighted to share with you uh, that i will be a part of teaching and mentoring at masters union over to you uh, my friend uh, over to you
thank you so much, uh, Dr. Jadhav. Uh, so now we would, uh, so now I would like to introduce uh, Mr. Pratham Mittal. Uh, Mr. Pratham Mittal is uh, the project director at Masters Union School of Business, and he's an entrepreneur who founded the Neta app and Outgrow, which is a software company. Pratham is a graduate of the Doon School and Wharton School of Business. So, uh, Mr. Pratham, I would like uh, I would like you to uh, introduce Masters Union to our attendees and uh, more talk about it. Thank you. Sure, I'll just take a quick minute. Um, so, thank you, Professor Jadav. This has been really interesting and really exciting. Uh, I wish this wasn't the case, and I wish we were talking about uh, much more pleasant things. Uh, but this is where the world has come to, so we have to uh, take uh, the right measures. Um, and thanks all the attendees for joining. Uh, we'll be back with Professor. Uh, Jadav, in just a minute, um, I quickly wanted to talk a little bit about Masters Union. And uh, as you know, uh, you know, Masters Union is a business school where real practitioners such as Dr. Jadav uh, come and step into the classroom uh, and teach. So rather than having career academics, rather than having professors who um, uh, might not have worked in the industry coming and teaching, we actually have industry folks coming in uh, and teaching. So uh, just to give you a few examples, we have CEOs and MDs and presidents from uh, LNT, Morgan Stanley, uh, BCG, Adani, Tata Group, etc., uh, either on our board or actually taking classes, uh, and this makes for a very hands-on experience for the students. You know, instead of, instead of students doing internships in the industry, the industry actually comes into the classroom and provides an internship-like experience. Um, so most of the classes, in fact, that are taught by such eminent personalities are designed to feel like internships, are designed to feel like apprenticeships. Um, where students regularly work on consulting projects on a daily basis. And that's how teaching is imparted. And most importantly, we have unique industry interventions that make sure that you get a hands-on experience. And most importantly, um, just to give you two examples, um, you know, every student uh, gets an industry mentor one-on-one, -on -one, right, for the entire duration of their 16 months of, of a PGP program, right? So every student gets partnered with one industry mentor, someone like Professor Jadav, someone like an MD of LNT, um, and they work with them to make sure that their career trajectories are figured out properly. Second, uh, we also have a fund, an investment fund uh, worth almost five crore rupees that students themselves will manage. It's like running their own fund while they're still in school. And we have many such interventions that make sure that students have a very wholesome and hands-on experience as a part of their uh, PGP in technology and business management. And you know, as Professor Jadav said, the world has changed completely and technology is going to play a very key role. And none of our business graduates would be complete unless they had a technology bent of mind. So all of our students will be given inputs in three major industries. One is artificial intelligence, they will be taught artificial intelligence and how to leverage artificial intelligence as a part of their business. Second is machine learning. They'll be taught the basics as well as the advanced stages of uh, machine learning and how it can be leveraged in various marketing uh, initiatives or various supply chain initiatives. And the third is blockchain. Uh, and I don't have to say anything about blockchain. I think most of the audience will be very aware of what blockchain is all about and how it affects business on a daily basis and especially how it will in the future. Um, you know, Professor Jadav spoke about the uh, the pharmaceutical market and that is one market that's going to be impacted by blockchain so much and we'll be looking at those things in detail as part of the pgp um so just to give uh, a one a holistic summary uh you know master's union is led completely by masters from the industry um you know the classroom is extremely experiential completely led by consulting projects and we have unique industry interventions like the one-on-one -on -one mentorship system, like the CXO shadow program, like the five crore fund that students manage themselves to make sure that the learning is always hands-on. So uh, with that, I'll, I'll, I'll stop here. Uh, I'm sure we all want to hear uh, more from Dr. Jadav. And if anyone has any questions about Masters Union, um, they can go onto the website, mastersunion.org. And there's a chat box at the bottom there and you can talk to us. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Pratham, for the information. And uh, now I would uh, like to request Dr. Jadhav to continue with the uh, topic. Please, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Pratham. Uh, uh, the unprecedented and cataclysmic crisis uh, that has been triggered by coronavirus is inevitably going to hurt and hurt Indian economy in a major way. 
But before going into the negative, great negative, let me uh, briefly talk about some positive effects uh, that this crisis has uh, brought on. Uh, first, uh, the most important thing is that the way our country has come together, the way 130 crore people of our country have come together in this hour of crisis is most admirable and most incredible. Of course, uh, there were some ignoble exceptions, uh, but the overwhelming majority has come together as one people. The credit, of course, goes to uh, the Honorable Prime Minister, who has made this into a mass movement. It is not a war between the government and coronavirus. This is a war between 130 people. This is a war of humanity against a deadly virus. And that's why it is to his credit that uh, the Honorable Prime Minister has made this out as a mass movement to which everybody has supported. Uh, we as a people have proven once again that in normal times, we keep fighting with each other. But when there is a real crisis, then we all get together and we address that crisis as one people. And then we succeed in converting that crisis into an opportunity. And it remains to be seen, but I am very hopeful that the same thing will happen here. Uh, although this crisis is much, much bigger than the earlier crisis. The second positive outcome, incidentally, is that favorable impact on the uh, environment. In Delhi, where we all stay, uh, at least I say, the air quality index uh, can go anytime up to 500 or even more, while the international norm is 25. In the last few days, if you see, it has been, air quality index has been in the range of 25 to 30, and if it rains, it one day came down to seven or eight. So that is uh, the uh, positive fallout of uh, this crisis. That's it. Friends, let me turn now to the grave negative side of this crisis. First, let me underline what is different about India in terms of grappling such a huge crisis. There are four, at least four factors which are very important in terms of India addressing this uh, grave uh, uh, crisis. First, before this crisis hit Indian economy, Indian economy was already slowing down. So that doesn't augur very well. Already slowing down economy and then comes a massive shock. The second one, as which I mentioned earlier, India has a very weak public health infrastructure arising from the fact that year after year, plans after plans, we have never spent more than 1% of GDP by the central government on public health. Third, presently in the last few months, at least, there has been, a, our financial sector has been very weak and under trouble. It is not a robust financial sector that once it was. So that is the third factor that we have to take into account. Fourth one, Indian economy has an exceptionally large informal sector, and this informal sector has exceptionally large migrant labor, which are very, very, very vulnerable. Now, after the historic speech by the Honorable Prime Minister on March 24, announcing the lockdown from the midnight, a number of things happened. Unfortunately, in the, there was a confusion in the initial first, first two days. Instructions did not reach the ground level for at least 36 hours. And therefore, people had no idea who can go on the road, what would be open, what would be not open, and so on. Uh, as a result, there was a panic buying, which was defeating the very purpose of the social distancing purpose of the lockdown. Second one, in the package that was announced, uh, regrettably, there was nothing about the transit labor. And the transit labor, those who live hand to mouth, they had no credit available, so they could not buy their necessities. They had no ability to pay rent because the jobs were lost. So they were thrown out of their houses wherever they were staying. So very large number of transit labor 
started walking home. If you remember, the headline of one of the newspapers was India walks home. You know, that was something which was avoidable. The heart-rending scenes uh, are carved out in our mind. And paradoxically, what uh, the feeling was, the people, the Indian diaspora, or the uh, people who are expatriates, students, um, workers abroad, they were brought in by uh, aeroplanes. But the migrant labor had nowhere to go and they had to fend for themselves for at least 48 hours. Now, nobody can claim that quarantining 1.3 billion people, 130 crore people, is an easy task. It is a horrendous task. And uh, yet, with the benefit of hindsight, I must admit, uh, one feels that the bureaucracy could have planned this better. Fortunately, uh, all the arrangements for the lockdown are now in place and streamlined thoroughly well and implemented thoroughly well. Uh, the importance of uh, hand wash, frequent hand washing and social distancing has been well impressed. Uh, has been well impressed on the minds of people, and people are following the instructions all and maintaining social distancing. Although in uh, localities which are very densely populated, like slums of Dharavi, you know, in, in one room there are twenty people. How can you even talk about social distancing in a situation like that? So it is an extremely diff difficult and challenging situation. But the medical uh, fraternity and uh, the uh, police are now handling the situation extraordinarily well. And we should all, you know, say close to all of them what they are doing. Now, economic impact implications for India of this crisis. Uh, as I mentioned before, the European Intelligence Unit has predicted that uh, India's real GDP growth will come down, uh, will slow down, growth rate will slow down. It will not become negative, it said. It said that the growth rate will come down to 2.1%. From 4.5% or there about, uh, which was there, it will come down to 2.1%. This doesn't look big, but uh, I don't think this is true. This is entirely contingent on the lockout, lockdown period. If the lockdown period is three months, there is no way that uh, economy uh, would grow by 2.1%. Economy would have to be in the negative territory. But it all depends on the length of the lockdown. There's a big crisis, big uh, debate and crisis going on about lives versus livelihoods. If we, as the Honorable Prime Minister very rightly says, every life is precious and we must save that. If we may concentrate on saving lives and keep the lockdown for a longer period, then there will be so much of slowdown. In fact, the Indian economy will go into the negative territory and there will be a very large unemployment, a large number of people pushed below poverty line, and there can be hunger, there can be even starvation, death. That is the other extreme picture. So we have to strike a balance between the two. CMI, the Center for Monitoring in Economy, a private uh, institution, it has said that the unemployment rate, which hovered around 6 to 8% so far pre-COVID, post-COVID, between January and March, they say that the unemployment rate in uh, India has shot up to 23%. That is extremely worrisome. I, we don't know how far these figures are true. In rural side, they say it would be 20%. And urban side, unemployment rate, according to CMIE, has shot up to as high as 31%. The total number, um, number of labor force, our labor force has come down from 443 million to 434 million. That means 9 million people are thrown out of the labor force. Now, this is very serious. No wonder, although the International Labor Organization has came out, come out with the statistics, they say that in India, around 40%, uh, sorry, around 40 crore people, 400 million people would be sinking below the poverty line. Therefore, whether you believe these numbers or not, it becomes very clear and evident that 
along with a significant loss of lives, there would also be equally significant loss of livelihoods as well. So if economy crashes, there would be a huge human toll. So we are debating between lives and livelihoods. So what should be the policy imperative for India? The principal objectives, in my view, would, should be save public lives, save lives now, and save like livelihoods immediate, in the immediate future. Honorable Prime Minister has said that every life is precious and we must make every effort to save that. That is absolutely true. Our topmost priority has to be saving lives. But our immediate next priority should be saving the, saving the livelihoods. Uh, now, this would call for a huge package. The package that was announced by the government of India some time back uh, by the Honorable Finance Minister was less than 1% of GDP. It was not even 1% of GDP. Can we have as large package as America? No, we can't. But at least in percentages, we should be somewhere comparable. America has spent, uh, given a package of 2 trillion US dollars. That is about 10% of American GDP. Our package is 1% of GDP. Certainly not enough. If you think that we should not talk about America, let's talk about Malaysia. Do you know what is the size of the Malaysian package? Malaysia's package is 16% of GDP. In other words, what we need is that in the immediate future, we should have a big package of the size approximately, not less than, I would put it this way, not less than 5% of GDP. That would be large enough, but not excessively large like America or uh, Malaysia. So we need a package uh, which is of the size of about 5% of GDP. What should be the priority for our spending? Number of priorities. First, building healthcare infrastructure. You know, everything that is required from masks to ventilators to PPE to everything. And the associated infrastructure, that should be the topmost priority, one. Second, this is very, very important. Social insurance for the most vulnerable strata of society. So this, we're talking about here, direct subsidy, direct transfer of money to general accounts without even targeting. Forget about targeting. There's no time for targeting. There would be mistakes made. But important thing is to put money in the hands of people. So general account, you know, that is a big strength that it turns out that that was a visionary step and it, was, it has created the, a mechanism where people can be helped directly. So let's use that. Bigger PDS, uh, free ration and, and free meals. This should be become a norm in the next couple of months at least. It should happen in everywhere. We have a stock of 80 million tons of food grains and we are paying heavily to maintain the stocks. And there is a dire need. The stock can even be distributed freely. The next harvest is around the corner. So there is a cost of maintaining it. This is the time. You, what are we saving these food grains for? for? For a rainy day, right? For a situation like that. Well, there can't be a better occasion to spend it, to use it. Uh, and so that must be done. Then there should be, a uh, third item should be, of the package should be, there should be a bailout package for MSMEs. That is uh, mini, small, and medium enterprises. These are the ones which are in a very bad shape and they need to be helped uh, uh, in an in, in innovative manner. Uh, they are the ones who generate a lot of employment, a lot of exports, and they need a big support at these critical times. And that should be also part of the package should be uh, uh, to directed to them. How do you finance this package? There are a number of ways of financing this package. Uh, first of all, uh, 
the PM Cares Fund is a very, very good idea. And very large number of people, the high net worth individuals have responded, companies, corporations have responded, they have given a lot of money. I think we have to go further. And uh, I have suggested a scheme to the government that 1,000 and multiples of 1,000, uh, even ordinary people, middle class people, lower middle class people will be willing to give uh, 1,000 rupees or multiples thereof. Uh, if one percent of Indian population gives 1,000 rupees, we still have 13,000 crores. Uh, so that could be one chunk. But other than that, there are a number of policy steps that uh, we need to take, which is relaxing FRBM, that is the Fiscal Responsibility and Budget Management Act. We should keep that act aside now because and let the fiscal deficit rise. Let's not worry for the time being about uh, uh, what the international investors will worry about uh, because this is happening to every country. A lot of people are scaring us that, no, 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 don't do that. This is the time to do it. The fiscal deficit must be allowed to rise considerably. So put the Fiscal Responsibility and Budget Management Act aside. Overlook it for one year, then you have to come back on the glide path. Third, relax the limits on debt that can be raised by the states. Fourth one, use the take away the MPLAD funds. There was a talk about it. I don't know whether the decision has been made. For the next two years, MPLAD funds of all the uh, MPs should be taken away compulsorily, and that would uh, generate about 9,000 crore rupees. Uh, then we can also think in terms of reducing the salaries and allowances of non-essential service employees of the government, state governments, and PSUs. For all of these policy measures, FRBM, relaxing the borrowing limits of the states, taking away MPLAD funds, and reducing the salaries and allowances of the non-essential services employees, all these measures could be greatly facilitated, in my personal view, by declaring what is called financial emergency. There is a provision in the Indian Constitution under the Article 360. So if under Article 360, if financial emergency is announced, declared, it will give the Honorable Prime Minister the wherewithal to effectively address this unprecedented and cataclysmic crisis. And I strongly suggest that this is the time to act, take a radical step of going for a financial emergency for a limited period, of course. Uh, by definition, it would have to be for a limited purpose. But this is a big war that we're fighting, and we should not turn any, we, we should not uh, hold back turning any stone. And this is one way declaring the financial emergency would give the right kind of wherewithal to the Honorable Prime Minister to address this grave crisis even more effectively than what is being done now. Thank you. Thank you very much. I will take more questions now. Thank you so much, sir. So we'll start with the questions. First, we have Mangalam Pandi. Uh, so, uh, he wants to ask, if we have recession due to COVID-19, what will be the impact on multinational companies and its employees, and how many years would it take to revive after this pandemic? Uh, it's, you know, at this point of time, we can only talk about uh, guesstimates, but let's talk about multinational companies. There is some people are spreading this fear that multinational companies will withdraw and the foreign direct investment would be withdrawn and that that is not going to happen because this is not happening to India. Some people are arguing that if we let the fiscal deficit go too high, uh, the international investing community will lose their confidence in the future of India. And therefore, they will withdraw and that would uh, sink India further. That is not going to happen in my opinion. Because this is something which is happening everywhere and every country is battling with that. So that is not going to happen. How long will it take to survive, to, to revive? Very hard to tell, but it would be faster than uh, what the prophets of doom are saying. 
there won't be any zinc recovery. They, they're certainly not, you know, they talk about UVW uh, shape recovery. U recovery is fine. You know, you take a, about turn uh, and come back. That is not going to happen. Second one is V shape recovery. Now, we should be aiming at a V shape recovery, going down sharply and coming up sharply again. What we should not want is a W shape recovery where it goes down, come up, and goes down again, and then comes up again. You know, that kind of instability we don't want. Worst is L shape recovery, which means no recovery at all. A big fall, and it stays at that. So that, those are things that we should be avoiding. So we should be aiming at a V shape recovery where there would be a sharp fall and a sharp rising. So uh, I would say that uh, it would happen in uh, uh, two years to two and a half years. That's my uh, uh, informed guess, but it is a guesstimate. More questions, please. Uh, so we have Harshit Goyal now, uh, and uh, Harshit want, uh, wants to ask, uh, what about the interest rates uh, impact by COVID-19? What would be the impact on interest rates? Yeah, RBI is uh, the Reserve Bank of India, which I served for 31 years. Um, they are going out of their way, looking at the exceptional circumstances, and they have relaxed and more liquidity is being made available. All that is being done. Uh, but the fear that some people are expressing is that uh, if government deficit goes up, if, if the deficit goes up too much, and if the government's borrowing requirement is too high, that will put upward pressure on the interest rates when the interest rate should be actually going down to be able to encourage people to go into uh, uh, more economic activities. So the a combination of the two, I think the RBI stance would continue to be uh, to 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 uh, kind of uh, uh, have interest rate uh, lower and uh, greater uh, liquidity being made available to various strata of society. That that is what I I perceive happening. Please don't forget that uh, as far as RBI is concerned, we have two great strengths. We have about nine lakh crore of rupees as reserves of Reserve Bank of India. And then I'm not talking about foreign exchange reserves. I'm talking about the reserves that they maintain. And in addition to that, we have the unprecedented high level of foreign exchange reserves of $470 billion. So we have a war chest. Now, that doesn't mean that we should squander it away. But what I am saying is that we have a war chest which is strong enough. Um, it is in as as far as the uh, developing countries or emerging market economies are concerned. This is an uh, unenviable uh, situation. Yeah. Next question. So we have uh, the next question is from Mauli, uh, Mauli Waha, and uh, she wants to ask what, according to you, should be the appropriate response of the Indian government once the lockdown is over. Government response when the lockdown is over, uh, again, first of all, we do not know how long the lockdown would be there. And as I mentioned in my uh, presentation, uh, longer the lockdown, lower will be the economic growth and uh, more difficult it would be to come out. While we will succeed in saving a lot of lives. So uh, there is a trade-off that uh, we are uh, the policymakers are trying to manage. So after the lockdown is over, when it gets over, I do not think we should jump into making crowds. Social distancing, the Honorable Prime Minister has emphasized time and again the importance of social distancing. We must do that. And even in the normal life, we should maintain social distancing. That applies to airlines, restaurants, everywhere. and um, I think the rules will come out, and in any case, I do not, give, given uh, the hints by the Honorable Prime Minister, I do not expect lockdown to just be over one day, just like that. It would be in a phased manner, depending on the discipline that people continue to show. Even in China, where there is an authoritarian rule, after the lockout was uh, taken, uh, was withdrawn, 
uh, in one of the spots, the picnic spot, suddenly 30,000 people showed up. And that created a huge problem. That kind of thing should not happen. Otherwise, the lockout will come back again. I think the Honorable Prime Minister will address uh, the nation again, where before opening the lockout or before even relaxing the lockout, the instructions would be given. And it is in our own enlightened self-interest that we must all follow those instructions in letter and spirit. Next question, please. Uh, so the next question is again from Molly, and she wants to ask, uh, how do you think COVID-19 breakout has impacted the dominant power of U.S.? Uh, say that again, COVID-19. What about U.S.? So how uh, how has COVID-19 impacted the dominant power of uh, United States in the world? Ah, okay, okay. Uh, well, uh, I'm sorry to say that U.S. has not responded the way uh, they should have. For a long time, they kept saying that this is no issue, no problem at all. And uh, the president was taking, President uh, Trump was taking it very lightly. If you go at his public statements, uh, he did not take it seriously at all. Uh, now the information has come out in New York Times and elsewhere that he was warned uh, way back in December. In November, in fact, he was warned and it was a part of his daily briefing uh, for quite some time, but it was ignored for a long time until it really went out of hands. Now, the Americans have uh, largest number of people affected more than 5 lakh people. This morning, the number was 5 lakhs and 3,000. And they also have the second largest deaths in, 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 the, in the world, next only to Italy. Italy has the maximum uh, losses of life, and next to that is United States. Both of them are in the range of 18,000 plus. And in my, my opinion, in the next three days, U.S. will be number one in terms of the deaths as well. This is the cost that they are paying for inaction. As compared to that, we should thank our government that we acted and we acted fast. Uh, we could have waited longer, but that would have been an unmitigated disaster in a country like India, which is so densely populated. So uh, we, are, we have responded well. America did not. They are suffering. In fact, uh, the medication, uh, as you know, uh, India has now again, and uh, we all as Indians should feel proud that we have again gone to achieve the status as uh, South Asia Monitor uh, says today, that we have again achieved the status of a humanitarian power in terms of giving uh, the medical assistance to on every country that wanted it, including the United States. If you remember, the President uh, of the United States actually threatened that if you don't give us medicine, we'll take some action. So we have given it to them and many other developing countries as well. Uh, in fact, I have a feeling that one way of recovering from this uh, big crisis is that in the pharmaceutical sectors, we can really, we have all the talent, we have all the wherewithal to become uh, a major power in pharmaceuticals, and uh, India can become a medical capital of, of, of the world. And that could be one way to come out of uh, the bad, adverse impact of this crisis, uh, but that remains to be seen. Now, uh, we have Deepan Chagrawal who wants to ask, uh, uh, no, apart from direct cash transfers, what are the different ways that government can alleviate the suffering of the poor? And should we launch a stimulus package on the lines of US and Italy uh, for businesses? And if that has to happen, uh, no, what would happen, uh, no, uh, consider, considering our fiscal deficit is already high? And uh, do we expect a retail loan crisis in India because many people would lose their jobs going to this crisis? Yeah, very good question. Uh, you know, uh, we should not follow America uh, as far as the package is concerned. In 2008, they had a package of $800 billion and then another package of $800 billion, which went, was wasted on the big industrial houses. 
even this time, the benefit is large amount of benefit is going to the large corporations. Uh, so as to persuade them not to lay off people, but they are laying off people and taking the advantage. Uh, I don't think we should be doing that. Our packet should be focused, A, as I said, on the medical infrastructure and everything that needs to be done. There should be no budget constraint at all as far as the medical sector is concerned. One. And second, what we should be doing is focusing on the vulnerable strata of society, which is very large, transit labor, unemployed, those who have newly lost jobs, and those who are homeless, and there is a very large bottom of society which is in the need of a crying help. And this package is important to help them survive, stand up again, and be part of functioning and rising economy. Thank you so much, sir. And uh, now we we'll move on to the last question, which is how would the manufacturing sector uh, get impacted because of this breakout? And a lot of startups are affected because of COVID-19. So what can they do to bounce back? Manufacturing, you know, uh, it, it, it has to go well, to go case by case basis. It's not possible to talk about manufacturing sector at a large uh, in one go. Certain sectors will do very well. Uh, certain many sectors are going to be affected very badly. But it is very clear that they will have to completely change their style of functioning uh, uh, in view of the changes which have uh, taken place. The COVID-19 shock is too big and they must adjust to that shock and look to the future. Those who adopt and change accordingly will survive. Those who do not will find it very difficult to survive. So um, uh, it is very important. The adaptability is very important. And that is where, as I was saying earlier, we need good business managers. And that is where I think Masters Union can play a very important role in the near future. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for your time, Dr. Jadav, and uh, I'm sure this was quite an informative session. Uh, you know, the details, the information that you provided would really help everyone in, in this crisis, uh, you know, equip better to fight with it, and I'm sure we would come out, with, uh, come out of it victorious. Again, thank you so much for your time. Uh, it was a pleasure having you. It was an honor having you here. Thank you, and thank you, everyone, for joining this webinar session uh, by MUSB, hosted by Shiksha.com. Thank you so much. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.